Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug, and in this video we're going to take a look at the last three sections of Unit 7, sections 12, 13, and 14. And in this first section here, section 12, this is about the common ion effect. Now, to illustrate this, let's imagine that we have a saturated solution of calcium sulfate, CaSO4. Now, like we said in our earlier videos, if you have a saturated solution, that means it's at equilibrium. So we have a nice equilibrium going on here uh, between the, the two sides of this process. Well, what do you think is going to happen if all of a sudden we toss in some solid sodium sulfate to this container or this uh, beaker? Well, we know that some of it is, is going to have to ionize, and we're going to have some sulfate ions swimming around in solution, aren't we? Well, this sulfate ion being added into something at equilibrium is exactly what happens in Le Chatelier's principle, like we talked about in an earlier video in this unit. Uh, we are adding in the sulfate, which is a product, so guess what? It's going to shift the equilibrium in the other direction, which means we're going to shift it to the left, and we're going to create some calcium sulfate precipitate. So this would have worked if you had added in some calcium ions as well, maybe some, I don't know, calcium chloride or something. If you, anytime you're adding a product ion here, it's going to shift it to the left when you're at equilibrium and you're going to make the solid. That's the common ion effect. Now, here we have a couple questions. A chemistry student has a saturated solution of silver iodide in a beaker. Which of the following solids, when added to the solution, would result in a solid precipitate of silver iodide being formed? Well, we have to remember, just like in that last example, if there's a saturated solution of silver iodide, it's at equilibrium, isn't it? Saturated means equilibrium. So you could add silver ions, you could add iodide ions. Either one of those would shift that equilibrium to the left and force the reaction to make some precipitate of, sil of silver iodide. Well, which of these four things or four choices has either silver or iodide in it? Well, there's only one choice, isn't there? It's choice D, the potassium iodide. Those other three would not really work. Here's another question. Calcium fluoride is very soluble in pure distilled water, but it is less soluble in fluoridated tap water and almost completely insoluble in benzene. Explain these observations. Well, we know that uh, fluorides, most fluorides are fairly soluble in distilled water. Not all of them, but most of them are. But why is it less soluble in fluoridated tap water? Well, fluoridated ta tap water has fluoride in it already, yeah, doesn't it? And so the presence of those fluoride ions in that water is going to limit its ability to dissolve as much calcium fluoride due to that common ion effect. It's almost like this, this, this water has a, a capacity to dissolve a certain number of fluoride ions. And the fluoride from the fluoridation is taking up some of that capacity. How about the benzene? Well, ionic compounds such as calcium fluoride are, are very polar, and ionic compounds usually don't dissolve in a nonpolar solvent like uh, benzene, which is C6H6. It's just a hydrocarbon. So in a nonpolar solvent, not going to work very well. Let's take a look at the next section, section 13, which is about the solubility of compounds and how that's sometimes going to be dependent on pH. What you need to know about this is that compounds that contain conjugate bases of weak acids are more soluble at a more acidic pH. But when you think about conjugate bases of weak acids, that would include ions like a lot of these here, or these are some common examples, I should say. Fluoride, carbonate, phosphate, cyanide, the bromate. And so if we think about compounds that contain those, those ions, well, we have a few good examples here. Now, a lot of these, as you can see, are substances that are not that soluble to start with, like calcium carbonate. That's basically what's found in limestone. Uh, limestone is not something that's going to dissolve in water very easily. 
However, if you have a more acidic pH, all of a sudden, a little bit more of that calcium carbonate, not a whole lot, but some of it will start to dissolve. And if you have enough acid and enough time, it's going to dissolve, isn't it? This explains why if you have a statue that's made of limestone, calcium carbonate, and it comes in contact with acid rain, has a more acidic pH, that acid rain, given enough time, is going to slowly dissolve that calcium carbonate limestone statue because of the pH dependency of that solubility. Now, compounds that have conjugate bases of strong acids, well, those have solubilities that aren't very dependent on pH, generally speaking. So we know that you know bromide and chloride and iodide and perchlorate, you know, those are conjugate bases of strong acids. And so these substances, if you get this more acidic, it's not really going to change the solubility very much. Let's take a look at section 14, which is about entropy. Now we're going to talk much more about entropy in unit 9, but let's just barely mention this here in this section. Entropy is the amount of disorder, or sometimes we say chaos in a system. That's how most of us think about entropy. Now technically, probably the more correct statement is the quantity of possible energy states of the components of a system. Uh, for all practical purposes, uh, that's pretty much the same thing as saying how much disorder or chaos you have in something. For example, if you have a solid, we've talked about how solids have a nice, beautiful crystalline structure. There's this very orderly, this very arranged crystal lattice. Not much entropy there. Not a whole lot of disorder. But all of a sudden, if you take this solid and dissolve it into water, you now have ions that are now swimming around in the water. And there's a lot more disorder there. There's more entropy. There are a whole lot more possible energy states or more possible places where those ions could be. More entropy is in that aqueous solution. We'll talk much more about this in Unit 9. Now, as you go forward, you know, once you have a solid that is dissolved into aqueous solution, that is an increase in entropy. Now, entropy is increasing. We use the letter S to describe entropy. Just like we use the letter H to talk about enthalpy, well, S is for entropy. Now, if this process is taking place and the system is releasing heat, the surroundings are getting hotter or warmer, then we say it's exothermic. And the delta H of that process is going to be a negative value. If, on the other hand, this process takes place and the system is absorbing heat from the surroundings and the surroundings are getting colder, well, that's called endothermic. And delta H is going to be a positive number. So I hope you were able to learn something here about the last three sections of Unit 7. Hope you've learned about equilibrium in my video series here. And I hope to see you in my next video where we're going to move right into Unit 8, which is about acids and bases. Thanks for watching.